are live. Hello, my friends. My name is Ryan. Welcome to my channel. Welcome to my life. I am bringing you another poem today. Once again, from this Harvard classic, for those of you who have been following along, this book has fallen apart on me, so I'm just going to go ahead and bring out the page I'm going to read. Uh, not all of the pages are like this, but they slowly are becoming that way. That's an old book. I got it cheaply. But the poems are still good. And today I'm going to read to you uh, a poem by Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, one of the most famous, if not the most famous, American author of the 19th century. He was very influential in all terms, philosophical, um, uh, poetical, and he had a lot of comments to say about just about every aspect of life. I highly recommend reading Ralph Waldo Emerson if you are at all interested in sort of deep American thinking that has influenced a lot of American authors and a lot of American minds, as well as many other people in the world. Highly recommend Ralph Waldo Emerson. In any case, I'm going to read you his poem right now. The name of it is Goodbye, Goodbye. And it's one, two, three, four. Ah, I got a fly in my eye. Four stanzas long. And I just found this poem uh, just a few moment, moments ago. I was uh, rifling through my book, my book that's falling apart, looking for an interesting poem to bring to you guys out there on YouTube. And I stumbled upon this and I just liked it immediately. Sometimes I, I come to a poem and I don't like it right away and it needs to build on me and sometimes I like a poem instantly. Um, just like some authors, if you ever read a book and you're hooked right away. That's how I felt with this one. Maybe because it rhymes, maybe because I can identify with a lot of the things he's saying. In any case, I'm going to read this. You tell me what you think in the comments below. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Goodbye. Goodbye, proud world, I'm going home. Thou art not my friend, and I'm not thine. Long through thy weary crowds I roam, a river arc on the ocean brine. Long I've been tossed like the driven foam, but now, proud world, I'm going home. Goodbye to flattery's fawning face, to grandeur with his wise grimace, to upstart wealth's averted eye to supple office low and high, to crowded halls, to court and street, to frozen hearts and hasting feet, to those who go and those who come. Goodbye, proud world, I'm going home. I am going to my own hearthstone, bosom in yon green hills alone, a secret nook in a pleasant land, whose groves the frolic fairies planned, where arches green the livelong day, echo the blackbird's round delay, and vulgar feet have never trod, a spot that is sacred to thought and God. Oh, when I am safe in my sylvan home, I tread on the pride of Greece and Rome, and when I am stretched beneath the pines, where the evening star so holy shines, I laugh at the lore and pride of man, at the sophist schools and the learned clan. For what are they all in their high conceit, when man in the bush with God may meet? Okay. So that was Ralph Waldo Emerson's Goodbye. I sort of varied uh, my style throughout reading that. Sometimes I sort of read it uh, a little bit more straightforwardly. Other times I went a little bit fast. And, um, and other times I, um, I didn't sing it, but I probably could have sang it. Um, it had, because there's so many rhyming words and rhyming lines, and it's, I don't know, you sort of get a bit of a melody sometimes when you read poetry, and this is one of them. Um, I'm not going to sing it right now. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to go over the stanzas and then just talk about what images and what thoughts and what questions it brings to my mind and then uh, maybe give you a point to reflect on and if you'd like to reflect on it or uh, uh, comment on what your thoughts are, please write it down in the comment section below and let me know. All right, so it starts off with goodbye proud world! Exclamation mark. I'm going home. So he 
is obviously saying that he is leaving the world and he's not he doesn't mean the universe right he's not leaving the universe because he's going home so he separates sort of the universe or reality the world and home the world and home the world if you almost think of traditionally we've always said um or in the bible there's the world they belong to the world and uh you know the holy people belong to god's kingdom so almost a separation of something that is more like home and then the world and he calls it proud and what does he say thou art not my friend and i'm not thine so i'm not your friend world and you're not mine so he's being very honest here uh and very very uh not provocative but he's he's being straight long through thy weary crowds i roam so he spent a long time roaming through those weary crowds so he he envisions the world as just a bunch of people right a crowd of people very tired very weary and he describes himself a river arc on the ocean brine so an arc is a vessel of safety and he's a river arc he's a river arc so he's from the river which is not cr as crowded as the ocean he's a river arc on the ocean brine so a little out of place there long i've been tossed like the driven foam but now proud world i'm going home so he's a river boat being tossed around the ocean and he wants to go back to the river in that so in my image the world perhaps this old cities of boston or new york or wherever he lived at that time um just these teeming hustling bustling cities with trains coming in and people doing business and he's he feels you know he's like not belonging to this this scene he's a river boat and this is the ocean these are we this is a weary crowd he's not friends with this crowd and the crowd is not friends with him this is how he sees it anyways next stanza second stanza goodbye to flattery's fawning face to grandeur with his wise grimace to upstart wealth's averted eye to supple office low and high to crowded halls to court and street to frozen hearts and hasting feet to those who go and those who come goodbye proud world i'm going home so now he's starting to give the dimensions and really put a face on this proud world that he's saying goodbye to so goodbye to flatteries and so flattery is capitalized uh goodbye to flattery's fawning face so fawn is when you want to get someone's approval oh you're sort of being affectative you're being fake and flattery um you know you say something nice to someone in order to court their favor um maybe you do a little fawning so he doesn't like that and that's part of the world right um you know you see politicians who fawn to the public even though it's not really how they feel in their heart uh sports stars who um who are flattered by people who want to get their favor so this world that we live in this world of status and wealth flattery is a big capitalized part of this world he doesn't like that he's saying goodbye next to grandeur with his wise grimace grandeur is capitalized so there's a lot of grandeur in this world and so the feeling of being big and magnificent and has a wise i am a professor i am a priest i am a bishop i am grandeur and i have a wise grimace Mm, my grimace mm. right so he doesn't like that goodbye goodbye you want to be mr wise grandeur and have show me your grimace goodbye and then the next line to upstart wealth's averted eye so upstart new wealth capitalized wealth so all these new rich people and their eyes are averted so maybe i don't know exactly what he means by that maybe you can tell me um but I imagine that, you know, these people, these new wealthy people, they're not looking you and engaging you and looking into your soul and talking about things that are deep. Their eyes are on the money, on the money, on the wealth, on the up, 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 right? They're not here in the moment. That's just my idea. 
next line in that stanza. To supple office low and high. Office capitalized. So here we're talking about your status in life. What is your job? Are you a minister? Are you a manager? Are you a factory worker? Supple office. Offices. Supple is something flexible, something that bends. So offices can move and shift and change. Low and high. So there's lots of different Lots of different levels of status in the world. He didn't like that. Goodbye. <laughs> to crowded halls, to court and street. So rooms and streets and courts that are just filled with people. He doesn't like that. Goodbye. To frozen hearts and hasting feet. And sure enough, you know, when you, if you ever travel, and you go to small towns, you'll notice a lot more friendly people. If you go to really big cities, um, of course there are friendly people, but because you're just bombarded with so many thousands of people, millions of people, people sort of close their heart up, right? They're not looking for heart-to-heart -heart, uh, contact with everyone around them because there's simply too many people around them. There's uh, so when you're around crowds, when you're in the world of men, a lot of times you do encounter frozen hearts, people who are cold. I'm not saying everyone's cold, but this is something that Emerson noted, and it is, is true, you know? The world can be a cold place. And hasting feet, people are always in a rush. Even back then in the 1800s and today, we're even, we're, our feet are even more hasty, right? We're always running around. I lived in Tokyo, which is a metra, mega metropolis, and it's just people are running all the time. They're running to catch their train. But even if they were to miss their train, the next train, sorry, I'm just checking to see if, if I actually have battery. The next train is uh, just a couple minutes behind, but we're always running, trying to get that goody, trying to make it faster. I want to be the first to work. I want to be first out of the office. I want to get in that line. So... Our world has, you know, cold hearts, frozen hearts, and hasting feet. And he's saying, goodbye. To those who go and those who come. So everyone who's come into the world and those of you who are going, goodbye, proud world. I'm going home. So this is not a place that he wants to be. He's going home. So now he's, that we're going to go to the third stanza where he's going to talk about his home. I am going to my own hearthstone, bosom in yon green hills alone, a secret nook in a pleasant land, whose groves the frolic fairies planned, where arches green the live long day, echo the blackbird's round delay, and vulgar feet have never trod, a spot that is sacred to thought and God. So, um, thank you for putting up with that pitiful singing. So he's talking about where he's leaving the proud world and where he's going. He's going to his own hearth stone. So he's going, your hearth, uh, I believe, is your fireplace. And the stone, sort of like the, the central area, the most important area of your home. That's where he's going to, right to where his home is. Where is his home? Think of it metaphorically. Maybe they're... He really does have a fireplace and a hearthstone that he's going to. But also metaphorically, here it is. Boozumed in yon green hills alone. So he is boozum, boozum, like a child inside his mother's boozum. He is in these hills. I'm sorry for pointing to my chest. He's in these green hills and he's boozumed. He's nice and comfortable in those green hills and he's alone. Key thing for Emerson. Uh, a secret, a secret nook in a pleasant land. So he's in a pleasant land, and it's a secret nook. It's not open to the public. It's hard to find. He's bosom, and it's a little nook. And nooks are very comfortable. They're cozy. They're not big, magnificent halls. They're little nooks, very comfy. Like, I found this, like, really nice. It's not a nook, but uh, I'm sort of nestled in this park right now. There's some people walking out there and over there and over there, but I sort of have my privacy here. And that's sort of why I chose it, um, because I feel more comfortable here. So this is where Emerson wants to go, to his hearthstone, to his secret nook, where he is bosomed in green hills alone. And then the next line, 
whose groves the frolic fairies plan. Where arches green the live long day, echo the blackbirds round delay. So the groves, so we're talking about trees, that frolicking fairies, so spirits of nature are frolicking, they're having fun. What is nature doing, you know? It's not busy making money, it's playing, you know? The leaves are dancing, the insects are buzzing, uh, and the image of fairies frolicking in under these trees is beautiful. Green arches, green arches, the live long day. So these arches that these trees are making, beautiful. And what are what sound do you hear in these arches? Do you hear a lot of voices of people clamoring about business? No, it echoes the blackbirds round delay. So he's talking about the the sounds of blackbirds singing. Their their sound. That's what he likes to hear. And vulgar feet have never trod. So in these groves of trees, in these bosomy hills, in this secret nook, excuse me, vulgar feet have never trod. So I burp, that's vulgar. Vulgar is bad manners, rude. Good timing. <laughs> vulgar feet have never trod. So rude and uncouth and people who can't appreciate nature. Um, who would go into these groves and probably just chop the trees down in order to make some more money and become that upstart wealth and make a lot of noise. Uh, maybe they'd kill the blackbirds and, you know, uh, try to make some money from them. So those vulgar people, their feet, they've never come here. A spot that is sacred, so it's a holy place, to thought and God. So sacred to thought and God. Why is a place that is secret? Why is a place that is green? Why is a place that is bosomy and green hilly and filled with these green arches and the sound of blackbirds? Why is that a sacred place? Well, if you look at the history of philosophy and religion, a lot of the holy, quote unquote, holy people are artists. A lot of those people tend to go uh, alone in the wilderness. Um, that's what the prophets did in the old Hebrew Bible. That's what Jesus did. Um, poets have always done that. Uh, people go into nature alone. And it's not necessarily to be cliche, although I suppose that that might be how one starts off. But the thing is, is when you do go into nature, and this is for everyone, whether or not you're looking for a holy place or not, you go into nature and you feel good. Nature is sort of a medicinal atmosphere. It's, it refreshes us. Not only is the air and the sunlight a good thing for, for our physical body, but the peace and the serenity and just the beauty. So this is by no means um, a climaxed rainforest or anything like that. This is a nice city park. But one of the reasons I like coming here is it's a lot more beautiful than being surrounded by walls. I feel more at peace. My soul is a lot more relaxed. So these types of atmospheres where you're alone and you're surrounded by nature and the sounds of birds um, it's a holy place that allows your mind to be free and one with eternity you don't have to use the word god with the universe with nature last stanza oh when i am safe in my sylvan home i tread on the pride of greece and rome and when I am stretched beneath the pines where the evening star so holy shines, I laugh at the lore and the pride of man, at the sophist schools and the learned clan. For what are they all in their high conceit when a man in the bush with God may meet? So he, this is the last one. So he's talking about how happy he is in his home. When I am safe in my sylvan home. So his wood, sylvan is synonymous with uh, woodsy, foresty. So I'm safed in my foresty home. I tread, tread is like stepping on in sort of a, um, a rough manner. I tread on the pride of Greece and Rome. So when he's safe in the forest, when he's safe in his home, he steps, the that means like the pride, we always talk about, at least in Western history, we talk about how great 
the Greek and Roman civilizations where we can still see their architecture. You go to Athens, you see the Parthenon, the Acropolis. You go to Rome, you see the Colosseum, these huge, magnificent structures. And then you read their history and the epics that they composed, Homer's Iliad. You read uh, Socrates' and Plato's and Aristotle's philosophy. I mean, there's just these magnificent cultures that produce incredible amount of culture. Yet for Emerson... Yeah, 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 you created, uh, he says, the pride of Greece and Rome. Your pride, yeah, yeah, all the stuff you created, but you know what's better? My sylvan home. Better, better, better than everything you made is nature. Better than all of that is this. Uh, and when I am stretched beneath the pine, so he's stretching underneath these big pine trees, where the evening star, so the star so holy shines, I laugh at the lore and pride of man. So when he's underneath the trees and looks at the shining star, and then you think at how proud humans are about their knowledge and their accomplishments, he laughs because nature is so much more. It's so much, uh, so much deeper. He laughs at the lore and the pride of men, at the sophist schools and the learned clan. Sophists are people who are all about reasoning and learned clan, you know, groups and outcloves and the academy and people who consider themselves so knowledgeable because they're filled with facts. He laughs at that. Why? Because he's got, I've got a fly, but he's got the evening star. He's got the blackbird singing in the arches. He's got the Buzumi Hills. He is in this sacred place, this little nook with God and his thought. And from this vantage point, everything from Greece and Rome, all the learned academians, aca, blah, 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 you know, uh, <laughs> the learned academy, all of these proud and prideful people who have done all of these accomplishments, well, from his vantage point in his sylvan home, he looks down and laughs and he treads upon their pride. For what are they all in their high conceit? So what are these uh, proud humans who have made all of these great accomplishments? What are they in their high conceit? So your conceit is your self-image of yourself. And your high conceit is where you see yourself as higher than you actually are. So what are they? What are they? Okay, here you are. You, you're a person who has all these accomplishments. And you see yourself in this high, wise, grand, wealthy way with your offices. When a man in the bush, so Emerson alone, with God he meets. All right, that's it. There's a lot of noise coming by. So those are the uh, questions I want to leave you with. That was Ralph Waldo Emerson's goodbye. And so from this video i will say goodbye thank you for watching my video i hope that you enjoyed it if you did please click like and subscribe till next time